All right, our next speaker is Joe Waiulo. Joe is the co-founder and curator of the Long Island Aquarium and the uh, former recipient in 2016 of the Mazna Award. Today he is going to be talking about bonsai reef keeping in a 20,000 gallon box. So let's welcome Joe. Great, I'd like to thank everybody for the invite and attending. Um, I do like to take pictures of audiences at times. So I'd like to embellish this one. If you guys could take out your iPhones and pretend you're not even paying attention to anything I'm saying, and uh, just put on that. Escort this gentleman out, please. <laughs> All right, three, two, and one. Perfect. All right, so. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to keep this talk a lot shorter, like the other speakers. I'm not used to short talks, so I'm probably going to scream through some of these slides. Uh, I'm going to get my timer going here to try and keep me online as well. So, yes, um, bonsai reef keeping. It's a term we came up with many, many years ago, probably 25 years ago, when we started being successful with growing corals. Um, and realizing how large some of these can grow. So here's just a, a general term on uh, bonsai and um, kind of our application then towards uh, having that term used to our corals. Uh, for those of you not familiar with where the Long Island Aquarium is with this reef tank, it's out on the east end of Long Island, about an hour and a half outside of New York City. So I welcome, it's an open invite to anybody that wants to come out that way uh, to give me a shout. I would love to show you guys what's going on there. Um, my life is pretty busy. I do like to do a lot of other things besides um, corals, but corals do uh, incorporate a big part of my life. 31 years now reef keeping. Um, hopefully the audio works here. There's no audio right in the beginning. Some of you can certainly relate to this. It's kind of my public service announcement at the moment. All right, so what brings you here today? Well, my reef tank is failing. Um, I think it might be old tank syndrome. Just don't know if there's anything I could do about it. Um, I mean, not that long ago. I was tank of the month, man. And you wanted him here with you? Yes. For support, definitely, yeah. And how long have you had this tank? Six or seven years, uh, closer to seven. How big is it? It's a 220 with a 50 gallon sump. Sure. How are your nitrates? Good. A defined good. Uh, well, the water's clear. So is vodka. Clean your pumps. Protein skimmer. Uh, the protein skimmer broke about two years ago, uh, but nothing in the tank changed, so I just left it off. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Uh, how are your phosphates? Uh, between two and three parts per million. Well, hey, Richard Ross, Aquarist of the Year, said his are above three, so I think I'm okay. Yeah, I don't think he was actually recommending that. What's your pH run? Around 8. And you calibrate regularly? Yep. You change your probes? Uh, well, they're not broken. Uh, Greg Biggerman said they last pretty much forever, so... Okay, Craig Bingman, and he would never say that. Do you change your light bulbs? Uh, well, they still come on. Uh, Sanjay said... Nah! Please. Bit of a name dropper there, aren't you? Hey, you know, actually, would you mind just showing me your system? Uh, I don't think I don't think I can uh, do that. Um, it's a little little too soon for me. Um, but I'm sure he would love to to show you my stuff. Yeah. Oh God, what is it? OTS? 
Is it old tank syndrome? Well... Oh god, I knew it was! No, 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 it actually looks more like your tank is suffering from Lars. Lars? What's that? Well, it's an acronym. Oh, and man, that sounds bad. Is that, an, is that a parasite? No, no, it, it stands for lazy ass reefer syndrome. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, what can I do about that? Well, a number of things. Start changing your water, for one. Uh, get a hold of Bob Stark over at ESV. But first things first, you're gonna have to get off your ass. So a while back I gave a talk on Lars and I just tend to incorporate that video into every lecture now because it's, I think it's really important to be reminded of our dedication and obligation to the animals that are in, in our care and we do get a little bit lazy about it. But part of this talk also explains how to not suffer from Lars. Um, there's been some changes recently in my life. I currently live in a houseboat down by the river and um, uh, but you make friends, you, you know, you just, you, and uh, friends lead to meeting new friends, so I'm, I'm very fortunate at the moment. Uh, but planning your reef tank, uh, being successful long term with your tank is uh, very important. Um, those are the two same guys you saw in the video, so the aquarium project is 18 years old now. Uh, I'd like to include this slide for, <laughs> for many reasons. Um, if you don't recognize the fine gentleman on the left, that's, uh, that's Julian with a lot of denim and long hair. Um, I have some pretty big glasses. But, so these, these topics used to be an entire lecture of how to set up and maintain a reef tank. So it's, it's amazing how far the industry has come that we can actually talk about the things that we're talking about these days. Uh, so just some history on the background of my little uh, nano tank, 20,000 gallons. It's 18 years old now. Uh, it's got a quarried limestone base of about 40,000 pounds of quarried limestone and that was covered with a skin of live rock. Uh, from this point forward, we don't need any audio, so I just wanted to make, of course, there's some annoying background noise on some of this. So this is current day video. This was shot just a, a couple of days ago of the tank. It's 30 feet long, 14 feet front to back. I clearly don't have a steady cam yet, um, and uh, the tank is uh, 18 years old with some corals that are 28 years old now. Um, so. And if anybody has any questions uh, after the talk uh, on any of the things about as far as the parameters and things like that, uh, there's my Sanjay Eflo that just got Sanjayed not too long ago, but some of it is still alive and, and will grow back. So this is uh, the west side of the tank. You kind of know you have a big tank when you have an east and west side of, of the tank. And um, been doing a lot of uh, Re redoing some of the rock work and aquascaping, some of the corals you can let go. Some really beautiful clams that have been put in within the last year from ORA sent me some of their large clams, as did Biota. Uh, so there's some beautiful, nice. Started moving some tubastrias into the tank as well that we've been growing and propagating. So I'm going to just skip forward because there's not much time. So this is a video of the, uh, which side are we on? west side on the right side of the tank so on this side of the tank I've got over the last year there's over a hundred hours of diving uh, on this side of the tank at the moment here's current day this is just right before the trip of the uh, east side of the tank so you would think 20,000 gallons you don't have to worry about coral sizes and things like that and worrying about how big a coral gets but it, it still does become a, a problem. Uh, here are some of the two bastia that are being moved into the tank, uh, working with Terrence right now uh, from um, this lovely company here. And we're going to rig up some auto feeders for these guys in the tanks. And some of these corals are available over at uh, Unique Corals at the moment. So the beginning of the tank, again, planning properly. This is the west side of the tank in 2000, 2001. Uh, and you can see how lush and thick everything is growing, but those become problems over time. These corals are growing in, um, they're restricting the flow, they're overshadowing. Uh, it would be like air handling in this room. If they started putting up walls, parts of the room would be hotter, colder because of the airflow interruption. So your corals are doing the same thing. So what would 
maybe possibly work in the first few years of your tank are not going to work in subsequent years. So you get a little bit cocky and you're thinking, well, I can really grow all these corals. Uh, but this was getting too large, too congested. Uh, so this was after going in in one dive and pruning some of the corals out and realizing, okay, that was not quite enough. So I went back in and did another dive and took some more corals out. Uh, a lot of these corals have been transplanted uh, to other public aquariums out at uh, Steinhardt, California Academy of Sciences, down at Georgia Aquarium, where they have uh, quite a lot more water volume than I do. Um, and then, so it's really a never-ending chess match. You're constantly negotiating with your corals, and um, you'll never win the game. So just keep that in mind. And then this is that portion of the tank uh, today. So this section of the tank, I have about 100 hours of diving in recently. But when I first started with reef keeping, there was the concept of that you could actually crush up corals that you didn't need or undergrowth and then put them back in your calcium reactor um, to grow more coral. You would have never guessed it. But that, that's where the hobby has come. Uh, this is going back to the east side of the tank. So you can see the quarried limestone base rock covered with about 10,000 pounds of live rock. Uh, this is the tank one year later, then in 2009, and then this is 2013. So that nice stand of yellow turbinary there had grown in, never thought I would ever touch it, and then realized one day it's getting too large. Um, it's making the tank look smaller because it's growing to the front of the tank. It's also growing very tall now. You can't see past it, so you're missing out on a lot of corals that are behind that. And uh, now visually, things are happening. Um, my eye is a bit sensitive. It starts twitching, and I realize there has to be a change made to uh, not only stop the twitching of my eye, but also for the health and security of the corals. So it took me about two weeks of internal deliberations whether to start um, renovating that portion of the tank. And it, it does, it generates a lot of anxiety sometimes, waiting, to, waiting for that moment, right? Um, but you get in there, and this is what you have to do in a 20,000 gallon tank. You get in with a, with a hammer and chisel, and uh, Julian Sprung used this photo wonderfully on how the hobby is uh, destroying the reefs, quote unquote, um, showing this, bad diver going in and smashing corals apart, and then he panned back, and it was just me and my reef tank, so uh, I love this photo. So this is the, the stand of yellow turbinaries. Just for perspective, this is maybe five feet across um, and uh, about four and a half feet wide. Um, so this is before, and then this is after the first dive. And again, you don't want to do this, and again, this all is applicable to tanks of any size or scale. As far as this aquascaping, it doesn't have to be on this big of a tank. Just have this vision, and I'll have a few other tanks later on to show you. Um, but so yeah, so here's the first dive, and I said, okay, maybe that's enough. I'll, I'll, I don't want to disturb too much, but it, you can see a little bit of an improvement. I removed a lot of the base rock underneath the corals. It's down now, it's lower down. You can kind of see past it, but I realized that was not enough. Um, uh, we can kill the sound on this one also. So I'm just going to show a quick little video here. So you can see how tall the turbine area has grown through all the years. It was started out at the base. So there's about 18 inches of dead coral skeleton underneath the living yellow turbine area. And that's, that's how reefs are built. So it's, it's, it's a thing. It happens. Um, so you wonder why your tools get rusty. This is a good reason. Uh, they say things are lighter underwater, not by much. Uh, this piece probably weighed about 85 pounds, and it used to be a standard piece of uh, yellow turbine area. So this video goes on for a little while, but given time frames here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shorten this up a little bit. Fish love it when you do this. They can now get into nooks and crannies that they couldn't get into before, and, uh, and graze on sponges and pods and things like that. So um, it's, it's actually good for a lot of reasons to get in and uh, do these renovations over time. So I'm going to just short go through here. So here's the, the turbine area. Again, it is beautiful. It was gorgeous. I never thought I would even get anywhere near touching this coral. Um, this was after the first dive. This was after the second dive. And it's kind of sparse. You can see it's like a newly planted garden at your home and you plant new plants and shrubs and you got to wait for them to grow back in. And, um, and it did. It, it grew back in. It grew back in very nicely. 
And um, you know, it, it's, again, it's this never-ending chess match with your corals. You're constantly trying to maneuver, outmaneuver them. They're trying to outmaneuver you. Uh, you start feeling cocky. They are going to humble you <laughs> so quickly. Um, so this was about four years ago. And then I was noticing over the last year and a half or so, some of it was do, still doing great, and other parts were not happy. And I'm not quite sure why. Water testing has not shown anything. Some of the turbine areas there are doing great. I introduced a couple of different species. They're doing fine. Went in one night, and uh, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid of Asterina snails, the small snails. A lot of them are tritivores. But I went in one night, and this thing was covered in pretty large, maybe half-inch, um, uh, white Asterina snails. So I think what they're, they've developed a taste for my turbine area. So I've been uh, manually re removing them on night dives, and then also um, there was some evidence that maybe blue linkia stars will eat them. So um, I've added a couple of dozen of blue linkias as some biological control. Um, in smaller tanks, um, different shrimp, the, um, I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but um, Anybody can just jump in and fill in the harlequin shrimp. Do wonders on, on reducing your uh, population. So, uh, so it's going to get rebuilt. Uh, again, it's that never-ending chess match. So what I did was remove a fair amount of pieces. Uh, so I think what was also happening, too, was this damage from the asterinas was caused, was caused by these asterinas. Then algae would grow. And if you saw um, uh, previous talks, about the damage to the coral, and then they have to compete with the algae. Uh, so I was cutting back the corals to just expose clean skeleton, but I also removed a number of healthy pieces from the tank, gave them a chance to recover in holding systems, got some new coral frags from uh, Aquarium of the Pacific in California, and I'll be replanting that ridge once I feel like the Asterina population is down. Uh, so uh, just other pruning and its situations, this nice burgers acro in the, in the center there. Um, it's, again, it's a beautiful thing to see, but it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a problem over time. My phone keeps shutting down here. And Rich Ross, if you're trying to text me out there, I've turned it into airplane mode, so I won't receive any fun texts while I'm up here, so. Um, but again, the line of sight now of the tank has grown so narrow. It's 14 feet front to back, and now it's very shallow. You can't, you can't see. So you lose that depth. Um, so here is pruning back. The white spots that you see are where the, uh, where the acro has been cut down. And then now it's cut down and grown back in again, but now you can see the nice colony of um, uh, Magnifica anemones. There's about 15 of them back there now that had started with a, a column, with one individual. So they've been splitting and growing through the years. So again, maintaining that line of sight is is really important. And again, it doesn't matter the size of the tank. So keeping things in perspective and proportion is, is really important. Uh, cutting grooves through uh, your corals so you can still have a big colony, but cut some grooves, cut some lines of sight for again line of sight and water flow and lighting. Uh, this is uh, the purple milka stylo that um, came back uh, with me and Sanjay on one visit, and uh, it was all grown from uh, a half-inch fragment. And this is just one piece. There's, there's tons of this coral around right now. Uh, maintaining some space around your corals, deciding on who you want to survive and who you don't want to survive kind of thing. Uh, so you can prune them back and keep some gaps and some spaces so you're not losing the size of your coral. And uh, that, that's, that's pretty important. So now with this, now the ridge also between, I don't know if this laser pointer is gonna, let's see. It's a tough angle here. But, so the, there's this groove is now wide open again. So again, that's again visual and also really important for that water flow. Because if it gets too clogged, if you're not increasing your water flow over time, those corals are going to get choked out. They need detritus removed, and that's bad things are going to happen. So that's what's happening in here as well. Oops. So here's the, the purple milka. And uh, Jamie was talking about some of this, uh, where he was making his acropores larger by doing a bunch of frags. Uh, so here's a bunch of purple milka frags that were pruned and, and 
glued in about you know, a couple of inches apart. And that's, you can have a massive colony within uh, six months. It'll just fuse up and make one big colony. Um, picking complementary colors to your corals and placements, as long as biologically they're in a good spot where they can be happy um, and healthy. Um, there, there's a lot of great color combinations that you can do that actually complement each other quite well. So um, again, corals growing too tall, they're growing to the surface of the tank. Um, so the undergrowth of this stylo, so I cut off all the living perimeter of this stylo for, took the coral skeleton out, let it dry it out, and weighed it, and it was 48 pounds of grown stylophora in the tank. That's taking up a lot of space, collecting a lot of detritus, uh, causing problems. And again, here's a, one of the purple milka stylos that was moved to a different section of the tank. So those are two inch squares. That's not egg crate. That's, those are two inch squares um, and my foot. Um, there's uh, removing some live rock that hadn't been moved in 18 years or 17 years, and then with the addition of a, just a plastic shelving unit from uh, Home Depot to, again, extend a, a line of sight. So you can see the shelf there. So instead of adding tons of rock and trying to, um, that would cause a lot of problems from a number of different things. So just putting in this shelf and then cantilevering it out and then weighing down the other side worked out very well, and then you get this nice ledge. So I was ex able to extend the line of sight within the tank by another, another three feet. And then this is pretty much um, the situation, but you can see that stylo now has grown to the surface, and that's a, an issue over time. And again, just things getting a little too tight, so you really gotta get in there. But this is current day, so now the, the milk is lowered down, and. Again, you have a, a great view, and the corals do uh, enjoy having that increased water flow and lighting around them. And then you run into problems with, um, here's a, two pieces of Seriatopora on the front ledge of the tank, grown from the exact same fragment, um, grown in nicely, and the one on the right decides to die, and the one on the left is fine. And uh, here it is. Completely loss of tissue, some protozoan, some heliocostoma there, not too much, but mostly just tissue sloughing. Meanwhile, the one on, on the left is perfectly fine, never showed any signs of illness. Welcome to reef keeping, right? Like, why? And you, you wonder why, and some people wonder why. So, of course, when you have your friends coming over, you have Julian and Raj visiting, of course the coral right in the front ledge most visible is gonna go in the crapper, right? So, um, long time friends, but you know, they still made me feel pretty crappy about it. And so, I'm still surprised that Raj actually wants to work with me. And um, so Raj and I'm, I'm working with Raj and MRC and Java here from the aquarium is actually quite happy about uh, the, the uh, arrangements as well. Um, Raj has some very close working relationships with a lot of people within the industry. Some are closer than others. And, um, you know, so they look happy. So here's that pink seriatopora. Here's that pink seriatopora, some few fragments that were put back in, uh, in the exact same spot and everything else going on. And um, so that was maybe not even a year ago and here it was uh, a couple of days ago before I came here. So it's growing back in the same spot. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is just a cool shot. Somebody was out front of the, of the aquarium with this glass sphere taking photos, and it was, uh, it was pretty impressive, so I just include it. So s some fun with your, what you can do with your tank. And again, just some more um, bonsai reef keeping. The green seriatopora here has grown into this massive coral head and is um, taking up a lot of space. So that requires getting into the tank again, pruning a bunch of it out, bucketing it up, replanting some of the frags. Uh, you can see the green uh, montipore. Let's see, sorry right in here, how it's tiered and grown up. It's like four, four or five levels of, so it'll plate out, send up verticals, plate out, send up verticals. 
here's a little closer shot of it. So if there's any question on how reefs are built, <laughs> here it is. Um, and this is fine, again, but if it takes up too much space and it's gonna collect a lot of detritus too over time. Uh, another way of keeping corals in your tank and not removing them is just sculpting the, uh, the undersides. So, so the, this acropore here, it started this green titan here, started down here, and has grown up through the years. And this used to be a really bulky and just a big old dead coral skeleton. So what was done there was just got in with some, you know, your wire cutters and snips and some screwdrivers. And it's, it's fun to be able to get in there and actually sculpt the undersides of, of the corals to allow some open space and fish like it. And, and one of the projects I was hoping to redo on the tank was the front ledge of rock work on the, here that's, that's due to be done. And uh, Marco from Marco Rocks was kind enough to send me some, some of their cut rock. So I'll be redoing the ledge up front there with, uh, with the Marco Rock, which um, I'm looking forward to diving in there. So if you need bigger pieces of Marco Rock, he can get that to you too as well for other projects. So, um, uh, so back to the corals, uh, again, the pruning and maintaining, but still keeping the look that you want. So this, I forget the name of this, it's a, just a green acro with the blue tips. It's really pretty, but now it's grown so tall, it's starting to pl block out the uh, sprung stunner back there. And again, visually shortening up the tank. So chopping it down here, those will regrow very quickly. And now the, the tank looks bigger again and more open for. So there's experts in every realm and um, certain people are not shy to tell you what's gonna happen and what's gonna do. And Joe should put his phone down for this next picture because um, I got his son telling me now. <laughs> so not only do I have Joe Cap telling me what to do, I got his son now telling me. So, but he was right. He was, he was right. This is Chase. And, uh, so again, here just was cutting through one of the acros just to try and open up the view. It worked for a little while, it wasn't really that great. Didn't, wasn't what I thought it was gonna have. And then while I was redoing this talk, I realized this time last year, um, yeah, I had a pulmonary embolism that took out a portion of my right lung and I'm really glad to be here and I'm still not dead yet. So I, that was a great thing. And um, so for quite a while though, I had to maintain and prune the tank from the surface and uh, here's a, let's say a quick little video of just coming down. And so, uh, but thankfully long grew back, everything's good and I can dive back in my tank again. And this is creating quite a mess. You can just see how much detritus um, is uh, created. And this is that section of the tank again. So over 100 hours of diving just in this section, but it allowed me to open up some of the rock work and actually get some more sand exposed, which is really enjoyable. But you don't realize how thick and, and how much space some of these corals are taking up. This is, a, this is a style of four. There's a quarter there for reference on how thick these inner branches can get. But it's not just, um, it's not just home tanks. I mean, it's just not public aquarium tanks. This is Bradley Cyphus's tank. And he had this big, I think it was a seriatopore down in this corner here. Um, and again, it was just taking up huge volume of space in his tank. And it, it is, remember that the, the, the door with the tooth? Like, you gotta work up to it. And, and Bradley manned up and went and, uh, oops, sorry. And uh, this is the piece here. Here it is in a cooler, and now there's all this open space. So again, it's that water flow, you gain that water volume back. More importantly, you get all this great new real estate to plant new corals, right? So that's, that's the other fun part about all of this. Um, so on some other home tanks, and, and if, if your slides didn't make it into my show, I apologize. I just realized there's not much time to include, but this is um, Mark Levinson's home tank. And uh, you can see how, again, how grown in this tank is. And um, it's beautiful, but this is not, you can't sustain this long term. There's gonna be problems that come in. Uh, I think Dwayne maybe had a small coronary at this point, wondering whether he should be there helping or not. Uh, and then this is the tank after the, the makeover. So it's still beautiful. Uh, the really important thing about doing makeovers like this on your tank and doing small sections at a time 
is like my tank, I'm over 18 years with my tank. That's an 18 year relationship, right? And you've got to keep it interesting. You want to keep it exciting for you. Um, so often it's really, really cool to be involved and in doing these renovations on your tank because it really reignites your passion. Um, wh wow, I can do this now. And so I strongly recommend like going home, looking at your tank, because we are really successful at growing and you don't realize how much of your tank isn't visible anymore or what space is being used or how much undergrowth is occupying space. Uh, so you want to do sections at a time. I'm not saying do your whole tank at once, but just really getting in there and uh, you'll do a little bit. And I'm telling you, as a, as a reefer, you're going to feel it and it's going to reignite uh, your, your passion if it's been waning. And again, we owe that because we're, we're, we're responsible for keeping these guys safe. Uh, one other thing I'd just like to touch on too, um, besides the bonsai reef keeping, uh, this is John, one of John Capolino's uh, smaller tanks at his house, is uh, aesthetics of your, of your tank. Um, and just keep them, like when you go to public aquaria and things like that, you, you generally don't see pipes and fittings and we, we really try to hide everything to create a, an environment. And I feel that's really missing in the, on the home hobby end of things. And I think people would really appreciate their tanks even more. Um, so uh, John has adopted some of the stuff that we do in the public aquaria where we have these removable backgrounds. Uh, Kydex is a type of uh, plastic. There's Sintra. There's a couple of different names out there. Uh, but you can see this back, his entire side wall, back wall is now covered with coralline algae. And what's happening here is your reef now is, there's no definition of your reef and all your beautiful corals because the background is kind of blurred with all this coralline algae and stuff. So I'll show you. Here's the same tank with the Kydex clean. Now you have, it's like, now it's like a high def tank. You have this beautiful black background, really crisp lines now. Your corals are gonna look so much better. I mean, this, this, is, this is the exact same tank, same lighting, and it's just so much nicer. The other thing, if you look at John's tank, you don't see pumps and power heads and cords and things, things that are distracting. And if you have a sensitive eye like mine, and um, it really can be distracting and, um, so, so this is the Kydex. It's just a very thin sheet of, of plastic. And you have to be careful because you're going to dissolve the coralline and all the other stuff that's growing on there with some muriatic acid, just stuff that you'd find at a, at a Home Depot or a pool supply house. Uh, so you do need to use caution with it, of course, because it is an acid. Um, but it doesn't take that much time. And it's a short amount of time to really have a beautiful uh, tank um, looking, looking a lot better. And I think that's, that's really important from the, from the aesthetics and the value of, of, of the tank. Um, so if you, don't have a, if you can't do a removable thing, if you're able to scrape the coral line, things like that. Uh, but just something that I'd like people to think about when they're either designing or building a new tank or something, um, really think about hiding all the stuff that's supporting everything. It, it just really gives a, a nice, nice clean line. Um, there's never not a reason to include this shot in, the <laughs> in my toy. It just, it just, uh, so you have Simon from the UK, Rich Ross in the middle, Charles on the right, and cute little Sanjay. So we, we like that shot. Uh, so fish management in, um, in, in your tanks uh, is really important too for proportions. And so a lot of my fish, even in my 20,000 gallon tank, proportionally were starting to not look good. They were getting too large which is an important thing to think about what fish you're buying, what fish are you getting. Uh, so some of these tanks were getting really huge and you think your coral's big and then this big tang goes by and you can't even see the coral anymore. So um, re uh, removing the, some of the fish from your tank can be a challenge, especially in a 20,000 gallon tank. So here I'm, I'm targeting one of the uh, big surgeon tangs and I'm using a floating pellet to bring them to the surface and you'll see him coming in from the top right, and uh, he'll be there shortly. He's coming up right now. He's getting a full too. 
So I was really proud of this catch. I didn't catch any other fish except the one that I was going for. You can see his head breaking the surface there just a little bit. Notice the really heavy work gloves that I'm wearing because I was wearing lighter work gloves on some previous tangs. And they call him surgeon fish for a reason. And he sliced right through those gloves and split my finger wide open. So um, careful handling, so there's a little slow motion. And uh, so managing your fish populations, really, really important. Um, sadly, I dropped this fish. <laughs> I was holding it for this photo. <laughs> and it wiggled away and fell back in the tank. And uh, so you gotta have fun with your, yeah. And, but I caught him four hours later, which was miraculous. I thought for sure this, so not the smartest fish, but I caught him four hours later, and he now resides in our shark tank. But what's nice about doing that, as far as your bonsai thing regarding not just your corals, but, but your fish, is now for the bio load of removing that tang, I can now add more anthias and not really add to the bio load of my, of my system. And my tank is a little more proportional now with smaller fish. Like when you look at reefs in the wild, it's, there's a few big fish around, but a majority of the fish are smaller. So this lends to the perspective also of, of the tank. Uh, so yeah, perspective of the tank and how to keep things going and keep things, keep things moving. Uh, so, you know, um, things happen over time, right? Uh, you have to adjust your feeds, your dosing, your lighting, your flow, etc. because if you dose what you did in the beginning, if I fed my kids the same as I, they were when they were younger, not, not good, right? So same thing with your tank. Your water flow has to change as your corals grow. Everything has to change. Your dosing, you have to be cognizant of what used to work, will not work as your corals get bigger and bigger. Uh, maintaining proper size protein skimmers is also very important. Uh, taking your corals for walks is uh, another thing that's important. Um, here's something you may not get to see every day. Let's see if it works. So this was a Magnifica anemone along the front edge of the tank that decided, hey, I'm ready to split. And it decided to split. Oh, we could turn off the audio, please, on this one? Okay, I'm here, the doing. Is it rolling? Um, so I wasn't able to dive at this point. Um, so I was gonna be a surgeon from the surface. Yeah, <laughs> so now I have two. And this has been going on in the tank for quite some while. These are the, the, the uh, heteractus. I think they're magnificent now. These, I think they used to be called Ritteri. Um, there may be one of these over at Joe Cap's booth as well at Unique Corals. So it's kind of like, you might, you might feel like this after watching that, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but that's how corals, and that's how a lot of anemones do. They split and they grow and uh, but so yeah, uh, and here's proof that it healed up beautifully and it walked up to the surface for me over the next two weeks and then I was able to just peel it right at the surface. Um, lots of different ways to take care of your tank and maintain it healthy. Here's some vodka dosing techniques. Uh, lighting, crucial, I'm doing okay on time, which is awesome. Uh, so there's about 26,000 watts of light above this tank. Uh, there's a mixture now of some LEDs up there from Coral View, there's a 300 water right over here, and there's a couple of 500 waters down the line now, and um, they've, uh, they've been working really well. And when you're maintaining the tanks and things are going well, then your fish are happy, and they'll do some courtship. Here's some genocanthus angels, um, kind of courtship here as the lights go down. Uh, Sanjay was talking about this in his talks earlier, and uh, how the lighting can really play an important role as far as when fish spawn and fish sex. So that was a spawn there, and we can collect those eggs. And you get sponsorship to, uh, to uh, hopefully, you know, um, but you can, only, you can only leave the net in the tank for four hours, but that's, that's okay. But that's how we do collect a lot of the spawn from this tank. Uh, we put that net in front of the big hydro wizard pump. We leave it in the tank overnight, collect the eggs. Um, Tyler and Patrick, somewhere, yeah, okay. So they're, um, they've got some good fish cooking right now. I'm not gonna jinx it and say what, what's cooking right now back at the aquarium. Uh, but we've done a few firsts here through the years and Todd Gardner, of course, and uh, Noel has raised some really great fish out of this tank. So there's, there's a couple of really cool fish coming down the pipe right now. 
Um, so also again, just keeping, um, keeping your tank uh, in good shape is record keeping. I'm not good on record keeping on anything else except my tank. Um, so things are checked regularly. And Apex, of course, I do just, I mean, most of you guys use LEDs, you don't have to worry about changing bulbs, but I do. So I put the dates right on the fixtures. Um, so yeah, well, you guys can read, but uh, why do some tanks not accept certain corals or tanks that used to house certain corals can no longer keep them alive? So here's that some of the seriatopores. 14 years my tank could not keep seriatopora hystrix alive. We'd grow it everywhere else in the aquarium, it would be a weed, and um, it, it just would never grow in this tank. I would try it attached to the tank, same water qualities, would never grow. Um, so why would that do? Are we at five? Two minutes. Two minutes. Wow, okay. So um, I, I can't really tell you why certain things do and don't do. Um, I, I will say that um, the only major change I made on the tank with the seriata, relative to the seriata pour, was um, adding the ESV transition elements. It's an iron manganese mix and a few other little goodies in there. And ever since adding that, I can grow the seriata pour hystric. So something in my system was missing. Giving it some further thought, wh why these things are happening, um, I think the real reason why we have a lot of problems with our reef tanks, and this is first time I'm releasing this information anywhere, is uh, Sanjay Gremlins. Sanjay Gremlins will show up in your tank at night when your lights are off. So I'm, I'm recommending checking your tank and looking for Sanjay Gremlins, because they'll fish in your tank, right? They'll sneak over, I mean, they come down on rope, anything. So I'd like to thank Gordon for making this slide up for me. Um, but this is the real cause of many of your reef problems, is this. Um, so good, I think I made it. Um, this is a touching end to my talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any time for questions or, uh, and I'm here all day, so if you guys have any questions on anything, right after the talk as well, I'd be more than happy. No time for questions. But I'm here, I love talking about this stuff, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.